Friends, we are gathered together in the beauty of this day and of this place, in the very presence of God to remember Mark Thomas Womack, to give thanks to God for the gift of his life, his love, his talent, and so to pray God's blessings to be with Ginny and Julie, Mother Phyllis, Sister Anne, and with all those who have been blessed by his life and his love and now grieve his death. It's my privilege to welcome you to Tabernacle Presbyterian Church. Ginny, particularly, it's a, a privilege to be able to welcome you. You are loved by this church family and hope you feel that as well as this circle of friends and family gathered here today. It's a privilege to share this service today with Julie's colleagues from Am Shalom 
in Glencoe, Illinois, uh, Reverend Pamela Mandel, Rabbi, did I say Rabbi? What did I say? Rabbi. Rabbi Pamela Mandel, <laughs> Rabbi Phyllis Sommer, Cantor Andrea Markowitz, and Cantor Giora Sharon, as well as these wonderful musician friends, thanks to each of you. In April of 2016, a concert was held here at TAB, organized by Ginny, in honor of Mark, with musician friends playing instruments which he masterfully created. We will enjoy much of that same music played on very similar instruments, if not the same instruments as before, in this service as we honor him once more today. So let us prepare our hearts to worship God. We're grateful that you are here. turn our attention to the reading of God's word, beginning with the writings of the psalmist, the psalmist who had deep faith while he experienced joy and sorrow, triumph and tragedy. We hear these words from Psalm 121. 
I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not, be, will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Amen. ancient words of the Psalms are meant to bring us comfort. As we just heard, they remind us that even in the most challenging of times, God's presence is near. They are to give us strength and guide us when we find ourselves in a place like we are now. This place is sometimes called the Valley of the Shadow of Death, as it says in the 23rd Psalm. But the text reminds us that we will not stay here forever. We will move along this path and we will do it together. As family and friends, we stand beside one another and we hold up the ones that we love. We hope that by doing this, we can bring some peace and comfort to those around us. And so inside our service pamphlet, we find the words of the 23rd Psalm and I invite you to join me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Nafshi yeshovev 
ancient music and the modern music and everything in between truly is a universal language and I know for Mark and for your family music truly filled your lives and continues to fill your lives and for all of us there is that melody that flows the lullaby starts our lives the tune, perhaps, that evokes that perfect high school memory, the song played at a wedding, and the psalm sung at a funeral. Throughout all of that, the music truly speaks louder than words. Sometimes the love that you feel inside gets lost between your heart and your mind, and the words don't really say the things you wanted them to, but then you feel in someone's song what you'd been trying to say all along and somehow with the magic of music, the message comes through. Music speaks louder than words. It's the only thing that the whole world listens to. Music speaks louder than words. When you sing, people understand. The longer I live, the more I find that people seldom take the time to really get to know a stranger and make him a friend. But the power of a simple song can make everybody feel they belong. Maybe singing and playing can bring us together again. Music speaks louder than words. Thank you. 
In the world of music, there is one symphony which is quite different from all the rest. The reason is that the composer Franz Schubert never finished it. Schubert wrote the first movement, put it away in his drawer, and before he could really finish it, he died. Hence its name, the Unfinished Symphony. Though Franz Schubert did not have the privilege of finishing his symphony, the entire world is richer in that it possesses this wonderful piece of music. For despite the fact that it breaks off before it is complete, it is nonetheless a masterpiece. Sometimes a life is in many ways like an unfinished symphony. There's a feeling of deep regret that we are not privileged to have seen that life live to its fullest. Yet at the same time, we feel that it is far better to have had the years granted to us than to have had nothing at all. The passing of Mark Womack leaves us sad at the thought of the unfinished years, but grateful for the wonderful memories of a life that was nonetheless a masterpiece. There is no doubt that Mark's life was a masterpiece. In the time that he was here, he was able to bring such beauty into the world around him. He did this through his work, with every instrument that he built or repaired or fixed or restored. Incredible music could be shared, but he also did this with his heart. He would share his big teddy bear hugs and his love with those around him. Most importantly, of course, with his partner in life, Jenny, and with his daughter, Julie. You were certainly the source of his joy and his happiness. At this time, we are so blessed that we are going to have the opportunity to hear memories and reflections from both of them. First, we'll hear Jenny's remarks, which will be read by her dear friend, Leanne, and then we'll hear from Julie. I am honored to read Jenny's words. There is a Hebrew proverb that reads, say not in grief, he is no more, but in thankfulness that he was. I am both grateful and blessed when I think of my beloved Mark. From the moment we met in June of 1985, when he fixed a buzz in my violin the night before an orchestra audition, to two weeks ago with late stage dementia, when he reached out for me and put his arm around my shoulder. I feel blessed that he came into my life. We were the match made in heaven, the violinist and the violin maker. When we were first married, we would sit and dream about goals we wanted to achieve, where we wanted to be in our careers in the coming years, and when we wanted to have children, for many years, those dreams came to fruition. Mark was building beautiful looking and sounding instruments. His perspective as a violinist and violist gave him great insight when it came to building instruments, as he knew what he wanted to create in terms of sound and playability. Mark was always seeking knowledge and experimenting to improve upon what he had done with the previous instrument. Just as many violin makers do, he was trying to unlock the secrets of some of the old Italian makers, such as Gaspar da Salo and Antonio Stradivari, to name two of his favorites. This was especially true when it came to mixing up varnish. It was not uncommon to find Mark outside on the driveway near the garage with a beer in one hand cooking a pot of varnish on a hot plate with the other. The neighbors would look on nervously 
wondering if the latest varnish experiment would result in him blowing up the neighborhood. There were also rumors when the movie The Red Violin came out that Stradivari used blood as an ingredient in his red varnishes. I started sleeping with one eye open in case <laughs> Mark decided to do experiments with actual human blood. Our greatest creation, however, was the birth of our daughter, Julie. Marth, Mark was the first one to hold her in the moments after she was born, and they formed an immediate bond. Since his workshop was in our home, he was the one to be with her while I was at work. When Julie was around two and a half years old, we got some film developed which contained photos Mark had taken of her playing outside one summer evening. She was running around barefoot, grinning from ear to ear with chocolate smeared all over her face. I had to laugh when I saw that photo because that is something I would not have ever let her do. But that was the nature of their relationship. Mark was the freer spirit, and I was the more uptight one. We balanced each other out, both in our personalities and our parenting styles. As the years passed, there were noticeable changes in Mark's personality and behavior. They were gradual at first and more pronounced over time. The situation worsened and eventually resulted in our divorce in 2010. In September of 2015, after a four-day hospital stay, he received the devastating diagnosis of early-onset Alzheimer's disease. He was 53 years old. This diagnosis was later revised to frontotemporal dementia, or FTD. It can start when a, parent, a person is in their 40s, and that is exactly when Mark's strange and uncharacteristic behavior began. After his diagnosis, we made the decision to bring Mark back to Indiana, and I agreed to oversee his care. I was terrified to have this responsibility as I had no experience with dementia, but I just knew that I couldn't let him face this disease alone. I wanted to do everything possible to make his life better in some way. Through understanding came forgiveness and compassion. And with compassion, love grew once again between us. Though Mark's journey was a difficult and tragic one, there was a blessing lurking beneath the surface. Our family became whole again. Over the last eight years, we developed a deeper love, a love you could feel without speaking. The way Mark's face would light up when he saw me or Julie or the way he would reach out to give me a hug. We were able to visit as a family when Julie drove down from Chicago for a few hours on her days off. Music and love were a part of every visit, making our time together that much sweeter. Julie, you did so much to help me navigate problems, find solutions, or gather information. I never could have gotten through the rough times without you. Thank you for always being by my side. It is true that blessings can be found even in the darkest of times. You have to be open to receive those blessings, and sometimes you have to look hard for them, but they are there. Gratitude helps us realize how fortunate we are to have amazing friends and family that have loved us and supported us throughout this journey. Many of you are here today. Thank you for your visits and calls, your food, for listening to me yell and cry, <laughs> your advice, and for moving Mark and his possessions from one place to another. Mark received excellent care at Majestic Care of Sheridan. To the staff members at Majestic Care, thank you for being Mark's family, for loving and caring about him. It means so much to us that we can have today's memorial service here at TAB, the very place we did a concert honoring Mark seven years ago. 
Special, special thanks to Pastor John Gable and Music Director Matt Kaufman, as well as the entire community here at TAB. We also thank my daughter's amazing clergy team from Congregation An Shalom in Glencoe, Illinois, who drove all the way down here this morning to officiate at this service and will turn right around to drive home later this afternoon. The musicians playing today are all incredibly talented and are also dear friends of ours. They have each spent countless hours in our home over the years, and though they may have started out as customers, they quickly became lifelong friends. We cannot thank them enough for their participation today. Mark Thomas Womack may have left this earth, but his voice will forever be heard in the beautiful instruments he so lovingly created. Mark, if you can hear me right now, please know that you never needed to find out the secrets of Stradivari and all the other makers that you so admired. What you created in your instruments was magnificent. I am honored to play the last violin that you made. I felt drawn to it the moment I picked it up, and the sound, even brand new, was heavenly. I will always feel your presence when I play my violin. It is time for you to rest now after all that you have been through. I miss you already, and I will love you forever. Jenny. I've been thinking about this day for years, ever since we first received my dad's diagnosis of FTD. It's hard to believe that it is here. It still doesn't feel real. My heart is broken today, just as it has been for the last eight years. From the time that we found out this disease was ravaging my dad's brain. Why him? Why so young, so full of love, talent, and so much life ahead that he never got to experience? It's just so unfair. For so long, we've been in survival mode, doing everything we could to make my dad's life as positive and comfortable as possible. In recent years, it has been too painful to think back to my childhood and the special years we had as a family. Now that he is gone and no longer suffering, I can finally think about the beautiful life that we had before our world was torn apart. My dad was a true loving presence in my life. Working from home meant that he was always around, therefore we were always together. <clears throat> I would sit in his workshop and play on the computer for hours on end while he blasted music and worked on his instruments. I can so vividly remember the smells of the varnish cooking and of the wood he was carving, the shavings of wood laying on the floor around his feet next to our Dalmatian Elijah. We would listen to Alison Krauss, Leanne Womack, Queen, The Beatles, The Eagles, Beach Boys, Jimmy Buffett, John Mellencamp, and both of us would sing along with the music at the top of our lungs. Dad was very active in my younger years. He played racquetball and would take me to the gym with him. One time, he decided he and his friend were going to teach me to play racquetball. Let's just say I didn't grow up playing sports and I had no hand-eye coordination. His friend hit the ball and it came flying straight for my face. And before I knew it, it hit me and I got a black eye. My mom was surely not thrilled when I got home. <laughs> we also went fishing often and I'll never forget the time I caught a really heavy fish. As it slowly came up out of the water, he said, oh, that's a catfish. 
I immediately screamed, dropped the pole, and ran away, <laughs> leaving, <laughs> leaving my dad to chase after the fishing pole that was quickly being dragged into the river. <laughs> He was a golf lover and started playing more frequently when I was in middle school. I would go with him and I loved it because he would let me drive the golf cart even though I nearly tipped it over multiple times whipping it on the slopes of the golf course. <laughs> well, on the topic of funny stories with my dad from behind the wheel, when I was 15, he taught me how to drive. I was doing pretty well and he was impressed with my parking skills until the time that I hit the gas instead of the brake and we went flying into the front of CVS Pharmacy, <laughs> denting his car and leaving a mark that is on the building to this day. <laughs> I still giggle every time I see it. I will always cherish our game nights at the kitchen table playing cards, dominoes, and backgammon eating his delicious chili and pimento cheese, watching the Pacers, IU, and UK basketball games, and our family trips to Florida, Chicago, Kentucky, Southern Indiana, Vegas, and cruises in the Caribbean. Dad took his coffee very seriously. We would drive up to the coffee shop in Noblesville, and he took the longest time choosing the best coffee beans they had in the store. He had a fancy espresso machine at home and would grind the coffee beans himself. And my dad also liked to try to make me laugh, and he often repeated these quirky phrases like, does a bear poo in the woods? Or how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? <laughs> but most of all, he taught me how to be the best version of myself that I could be, to always be aware and to take in the beauty around me, to see the best in people, and to give everyone a chance. He smiled and said hello to everyone. Of course, my parents also passed on their love of music to me, and I know my dad was so proud when I followed in his footsteps and went to IU. While the last decade or so has been full of challenges, there's also been so much beauty that has come from it. My mom, dad, and I became a family unit again and shared so much love and cherished time together. Mom, you went above and beyond to care for dad when there was no one else to be there for him. You sacrificed so much so I could pursue my dream of becoming a cantor, and there will never be words to describe my gratitude to you. Dad was so blessed to have you as his life partner, and I'm so proud to be your daughter. In addition to my mom, there were so many people that worked at Majestic Care that cared so deeply for my dad on a daily basis. We are so grateful to each and every one of them. Watching them care for my dad, especially in the last few weeks, showed me how much love they had for him, and I know they all brought him so much joy as well. The day my dad died, we listened to one of his favorite songs, I'll Fly Away by Alison Krauss, one last time. Here's a little bit of the lyrics. Some bright morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. To that home on God's celestial shore, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away. Dad, your soul is finally free to fly away. I know you will always be with me, and I'll always be your little girl. I love you. Before Mark was a husband and a dad, his journey began in Bloomington, Indiana, but he grew up outside of Louisville in New Albany. 
There he was raised by his parents, Phyllis and Gerald. They created a pleasant childhood for Mark and his younger sister, Anne. They had a love of the outdoors that they shared with their children. But more importantly, they passed along a love of music. Pictures show that Mark had a ukulele as a toddler, but his real interest in music developed in the fourth grade. This was when an inspiring music teacher named Reuben Scher came to each classroom and played for the students in an effort to enroll them in music lessons. Mark was enamored and was soon learning how to play the violin. This was the start of a lifelong love affair with music. A couple of years later, Mark discovered that there was a violin maker living in his neighborhood. Mark would often visit Mr. Kleinert in his shop almost every day after school. When he was a bit older, he joined the Floyd County Youth Symphony. They would tour around the country and even went on a trip to Romania that Mark always recalled fondly. Though Mark was busy with his music, he always had time for family and friends. Mark and Anne were very close growing up. Mark was a kind and patient older brother. Every night he would play Orange Blossom special for Anne on repeat. He also taught her how to ride a bike and eventually to drive. He would include her in games of baseball, basketball, and dodgeball. As far as friends go, Mark always had many. Let's just say he was always up for a good time. Some may even say he was also a bit of a ladies' man. Not surprising, as he was just so sweet and nice to be around. Following high school, Mark went on to attend Indiana University. There he was studying violin and viola performance when he stumbled upon the Stringed Instrument Restoration Program. Right away, he signed up for the class, and soon he began to develop his incredible restoration skills. After graduation, Mark moved to Memphis to continue his studies and work at restoring instruments. He had a viola that he had just repaired for a local mus musician, and one night went to drop it off. When he got to the apartment, he found that the musician had a friend in town. Her name was Ginny Carroll, and she was auditioning for the Memphis Symphony. The two invited Mark to join them for dinner. Ginny mentioned to Mark that her violin was making a buzzing sound. Mark took an immediate interest in the violin, but more than that, he took an interest in Ginny. <laughs> Ginny, you said that it was love at first sight for both of you. You bonded over your love of music, but soon found that you had other interests and values in common. Jenny, you said that Mark was always so warm and gentle, but he was also so solid in difficult situations. He gave great advice and was helpful in finding solutions to problems. The two were soon engaged, with Mark proposing with a walnut. Actually, he had placed a ring inside a walnut and masterfully sealed it closed with his tools. Ginny then had to crack the nut open to reveal what was inside. Fortunately, she thought that was a creative proposal and said yes. The two were married on the 4th of July in St. Louis not long after. Mark then learned of an opportunity in Indianapolis. The owner of a local violin shop needed another luthier, so they decided to make the move. There they began to create a beautiful life together. They were thrilled when they welcomed Julie into the world. Mark absolutely loved being a father, other than the fact that he didn't get much sleep at first. He said having a baby was like being locked in a room with a wasp. As a parent, Mark was very involved. He would take Julie sledding into the park, and she became his sidekick, often tagging along for his favorite activities. Julie, as you said, your dad was always so present and such an important part of your life. 
how grateful you were that he was able to be at your wedding to Harrison, who was a loyal son-in-law. And I remember when your dad was able to make a trip to Am Shalom. He beamed with pride as he listened to your beautiful voice and saw how adored you are by everyone in our congregation. When Julie was young, Mark had the idea to open a violin repair shop in the garage, mostly so that he could be home more often. This was where his career really took off. He had a niche for creating small violas that could still produce an amazing sound. The orders came flooding in, as did the awards and accolades. But the part of his work that brought him the most joy was the people. He loved meeting the musicians who played his instruments. They were instantly connected and often became his dear friends. It is Mark's friends and family who brought so much meaning to his life. You were the ones who treated him with such love and kindness, especially when his health began to decline. Ginny, you were a completely selfless and devoted caretaker. And Julie and Harrison, you were dedicated beyond measure. While the last eight years of Mark's life presented challenges and difficulties, they also brought blessings. Certainly one of those was the love that surrounded him until the very end. So today we take heart in that and we remember Mark Womack as a loving husband and father. And more than that, he was a lovely human being. May we all strive to follow the example of this amazing man, and may we all strive to fill our years with as much life as Mark filled his in the time that he was with us. Zichrono Livracha, may his memory always be for a blessing. I am certain that there are memories like the ones that we heard today that are going to continue to move us to tears. But we hope and pray that in time that these memories will also bring us joy as we reflect on Mark's life and what he meant to us. In the Psalms, it so wisely says, those who sow in tears will one day reap in joy.
O God of life, amid the ceaseless tides of change which sweep away the generations, your love remains to comfort us and to give us hope. Around us are life and death, decay and renewal, the flowing rhythm that all things obey. Our life is a dance to a song we cannot hear. Its melody courses through us for a little while, then seems to cease. Whence the melody? And whither does it go? In darkness as in light, we turn to you, O God, the source of life and the answer to all its mysteries. I invite you to rise for the memorial prayer. <clears throat> Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Mark Thomas Womack, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in your eternal presence in the shadow of your wings, and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace, and let us all say, Amen. In those words, we ask God to protect Mark's soul and watch over it, but perhaps that is our charge as well. As long as we remember Mark and we tell the stories like the ones we heard today, and we continue to play his beautiful instruments, and we give the love that he gave us to others, and we weave him into the fabric of our own lives, we can ensure that his spirit will continue to live on through us and with us. Perhaps we can find peace in that knowledge. So we commit ourselves to always honoring Mark's memory. As for the first time together, we recite the mourner's prayer, the words of the Kaddish, which can be found on the back of your program. Yit gadal v'yit kadash shemei rabba be'alma divra chirte v'amlich malchute v'chayechon uv'yomechon uv'haye dechol beit Yisrael v'agala uv'izman kari v'imru amen yehe shemei rabba mevarach le'olam olamei almaya yit barak v'yishtabak v'yit pa'ar v'yit romam v'yit nase. Vita dar, vita la, vita lal, shemeda kudasha, brihu. La ela min kol birchata vishirata. Tush bechata venachamata. Damiran bel mavi imru. Amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shemaya. Dechaim alenu veal kol Yisrael. 
bimru amen. O se shalom bimromav, hu ya se shalom, aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael, bimru amen. May the source of peace bring peace to our friends who are in mourning and comfort to all who are bereaved among us. And we say together. Amen. Friends, it has been such a great privilege for us to share in this time with you. And Jenny, we continue to hold you and Julie and Phyllis and Anne and your family and friends in prayer as we would ask each of you to continue as we trust you will. We will invite you to join the family in our parlor immediately following this service down these hallways and we'll guide you that way and remind you of the Shiva that will be at Am Shalom in Glencoe on Wednesday, April 26th from four until eight with prayer at six o'clock p.m. We'll close this service with the Traveler's Prayer, a beautiful piece which holds particular significance to the Womack family because Julie, you sang it at this service honoring your dad back in 2016. It is a prayer for safe journey. Now as we're remaining standing, let me pronounce over us the priestly prayer given by Aaron in Numbers chapter six. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Amen. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance and shine his light into your lives this day and forevermore. Amen and amen. We go in his peace. I invite you to be seated for the closing of this song. Thank mm -hmm. you.